Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to welcome you to the roundtable discussion, the COVAX Initiative and Equitable Global Vaccine Distribution. Sponsored by the Humanitarian Action Initiative at the Elliott School of International Affairs, the Humanitarian Health Program at the Milken Institute School of Public Health, the Leadership Ethics and Practice Initiative at the Elliott School of International Affairs, and the Department of Engineering Management and Systems Engineering, all here at the George Washington University. My name is Mariam Delof, and I'm Director of the Humanitarian Action Initiative and Associate Professor of International Affairs here at GW. I have the honor and privilege of introducing our distinguished panelists and moderating this event today. It has been just over one year that the COVID-19 pandemic began. This week, the United States passed the devastating toll of 500,000 COVID-related deaths and emerging variants of the virus pose new and different threats. But there is hope. Science, human ingenuity, and perseverance have successfully developed a suite of COVID-19 vaccines at an unprecedented pace with new mRNA technologies and through collaborative processes. Perhaps not surprisingly, the announcement of the scientific accomplishment was quickly followed by a scramble to obtain vaccine doses. Competition fueled by vaccine nationalism and a narrow view of health security as synonymous with national security. The COVAX initiative, the subject of our roundtable today, was established by Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the World Health Organization, and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations as a global mechanism designed to respond to these challenges to foster global solidarity by shifting mindsets to an understanding that no individual is safe if everyone is not safe, and to facilitate equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. The COVAX initiative also faces real technical challenges of aligning global vaccine distribution with national capacity and increasing country readiness to receive, transport, store, distribute, and administer the vaccine. Today, we are joined by a distinguished panel of guests with deep expertise in global health. Their accomplishments, accomplishments and bios are so extensive that these brief introductions cannot do them justice. Dr. Jeremy Yude is Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota Duluth and an internationally recognized expert on global health politics and governance with countless publications on the topic, including five books and three co-edited volumes. Lois Pace is a leader in global health who has worked in more than 15 countries delivering health programs and engaging in health advocacy. She was a member of President Biden's COVID-19 Advisory Board and President and Executive Director of the Global Health Council. Dr. John Kim Andrus is Adjunct Professor of Global Health here at GW and Director and Professor of the Division of Vaccines and Immunization of the University of Colorado's Center for Global Health. He has extensive experience working on vaccine use in developing countries at the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization. Dr. Adam Jakimowicz is a lecturer of Systems Engineering and Engineering Management here at GW and has over 18 years of experience in planning for and responding to disasters around the globe. Each of our panelists will present brief remarks and then we will consider some questions circulated prior to the roundtable. We will then open up to audience questions. Please place your questions in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Jeremy, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thanks to George Washington for putting this together. Thanks to you, Miriam, for for the for organizing and moderating this. And thanks to all the the attendees for taking your lunch hour to to be a part of this. Um, so you may have seen in the news earlier this week that Ghana is the first country in the world to receive COVID-19 vaccines through COVAX. Uh, they received 600,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca. Um, vaccine. It arrived, they arrived in Accra on Wednesday after being shipped from India, and Ghana will be starting its vaccination campaign in this coming week. Now, Ghana has a population of 30 million people, so this is just a, a, a drop in the bucket, but it's a start. 
And there are already plans, Cote d'Ivoire is the next country that, that is lined up to, to get these, these vaccines. So we are starting to see some of the, the fruits of, of this labor from, from COVAX. But what I wanted to talk about um, in my brief remarks is to think about how COVAX really exposes some of these central paradoxes that exist within global health governance. Because if we think about global health and global public health in particular, we're really talking about a weakest link public good. The nature of our interdependence means that we're only as collectively safe as those places that have the fewest number of vaccines, which means that we can't really let our guard down, if you will, until we have this widespread access to vaccination where people are able to do this. But based on current projections, while wealthy countries are looking to be able to roll out vaccination by the end of, of this year, uh, low and low middle income countries are looking at 2022, 2023, perhaps even 2024 before they're, at, they're able to really get the vaccination campaigns underway. And this is part of what, what COVAX is here to, to address. So we know that there's this interdependence that we have to address. On the other hand, global health governance is still based on this model of Westphalian sovereignty that countries have the power and, and the, the rights to make the decisions within their own borders. The World Health Organization, which is a key component of COVAX, lacks punitive powers. It doesn't have the ability to, say, fine states if they aren't um, abiding by some of these rules and regulations. It doesn't really have the, you, know, you can't send a country to country jail or something like that if they're, they're not living up to their expectations. WHO could could kick a country out, but that that is is a rare um, power that they would exercise. Their only real power is naming and shaming states, trying to call attention to um, to states um, that aren't in compliance with the sorts of norms that exist within global health governance. And now, in most instances, most countries, most of the time, will abide by these global health norms that exist. The question is always what happens when push comes to shove? And that's exactly what happens when we have these sorts of, of pandemics. When there is this sense of threat, or as Miriam uh, talked about, the sense of our national security is being threatened, how is that going to affect how states are, are acting? How do we move from a, a stance that is based more on medical nationalism to one that is something more like a shared sense of medical cosmopolitanism? to allow for some of these, these opportunities to recognize the, this interdependence through governance means. And to that end, I'm optimistically pessimistic or pessimistically optimistic about COVAX and what it, it, it means. Because on the one hand, I mean, holy stars, this is an incredible sort of, of process. It's everything about the, 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 the development of this, this vaccine and the fact that you've got nearly every country in the world coming together through COVAX, making this pledge that, that the wealthier countries are going to subsidize the, the less wealthy countries in order to make sure that they get access. This is incredible. This shows a recognition of this interdependence and the fact that the Biden administration has come in and pledged $4 billion for COVAX's efforts gets COVAX a lot further along in its, its goals uh, and the financial needs that it has in order to, to undertake its, its operations. On the other hand, though, we see that, that, that these efforts have been hampered by financial challenges, logistical challenges. We've seen countries essentially jumping the line to make sure that they get early access, buying up supplies. In some countries, buying up significantly more supplies of the vaccine than they would ever need for their own populations, um, which in turn makes it that much harder for other countries to get access to the vaccine and drives up the price of the vaccine. So it makes it that much harder for COVAX to do its, its its uh, its job. And, and I think this kind of speaks to one of the, the big blind spots that exists within COVAX, which has to do with intellectual property rights and some of the, the regulations that we have around pharmaceuticals within the international system. And you know, if you think about it, there's almost this tension between the sorts of powers and responsibilities that a group like the World Health Organization has versus what the World Trade Organization has. And I think that's going to be one of the things that um, that, that is going to have to be addressed but if we use uh, this, I'll, I'll finish up here. If we use antiretroviral drugs, the drugs that are used to treat people who are HIV positive, as an example, we did see a willingness within the international community to get involved in making them more broadly uh, available. 
though that largely came after wealthy countries made sure that they had taken care of their own populations. So one of the questions that I think we have to look at when we're looking at these questions of distribution is where's the Zaki Akhmat of COVID vaccines? Where is the, how can we see civil society getting involved to help push for this and to put some of that pressure on states to really move in more of that cosmopolitan area? WHO can name and shame states, but there's also a power when civil society gets involved. So where is that opportunity going to, to come up? So I'll leave it there and I will listen to the, the remarks from our other fabulous panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, Lois? Thanks, Mary. I mean, I'm already inspired by Jeremy's remarks. It's sparking so much for me. So I'll try to um, keep my comments tight so we can actually get into a discussion. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, I think I will try and pick up where Jeremy left off in terms of uh, a sort of call to action, um, both uh, of governments and of uh, civil society or citizens of this world uh, with regards to vaccine equity. Um, as Miriam said, I have been uh, at the head of Global Health Council and Advocacy Coalition based here in DC, but working in partnership with a number of organizations worldwide. Um, on this very question or issue. Um, we are delighted to see the news about Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, um, obviously, um, but keep in mind, um, as I think has been said, um, that that is just a starting point. Um, the goal of COVAX um, out the gate was really just to provide enough vaccines for 20% uh, of the population in 190 countries, and that is not hardly um, what is required in many, um, in any country around the world, but in particular um, puts at risk uh, countries with limited resources to procure those vaccines for themselves. I think it's great that as a complement to COVAX, you see these regional initiatives, uh, particularly um, the AU initiative um, that have been launched and as an effort to reach 60% of their population. And I think that we can maybe have a discussion about kind of where that stands, um, but I think it's a sign that these leaders themselves aren't going to wait on uh, other countries that traditionally come through um, to sort of close that gap for them. And I think that the leaders of that initiative um, really are keen to ensure that they're not dropping the ball um, or that those particularly countries on the African continent aren't at a greater risk than other countries because of this sense of vaccine or very real vaccine nationalism that that we see happening right now. So that's what, how I'm looking at at least the, the supply um, question. I think in terms of how we as citizens, as advocates could drive that. Um, I think Jeremy alluded to the People's Vaccine Initiative, for example, that really has been calling for greater equity. You even have WHO launching its vaccine equity campaign, Dr. Tedros himself, calling on at very least global vaccination of healthcare workers and the elderly following on those, those frontline healthcare workers. And so ensuring that at least as a baseline, we're all moving in the same direction at a similar, at a similar time. Um, and in addition to calling for vaccinations, really acknowledging that, you know, I think one of the things I want to step back in and, and acknowledge is that we still are in a situation in the US where not even all our healthcare workers aren't vaccinated, right? Let alone um, our, our elderly population. And so we need more product overall. And so it's one of the reasons why that WHO agenda is also calling for uh, greater manufacturing or at least sharing of know-how so that, that those products can be ramped up, right? And so that we're not in a situation where there's this horse trading or hoarding um, of, of these life-saving innovations. So that's, that's you know, I, I, I think that that is also a problem we, we very much need to solve and, and not just in the short term, but in the medium and perhaps long term, depending on how we need to continue rolling out these vaccines um, as COVID itself evolves as a virus. Um, uh, I think another point that I wanted to make in all this is um, not, that we focus solely on vaccines. I know that's the purpose of this discussion. I think it's quite relevant. Um, but just keep in mind that I think as people know, there is a, a larger, it's what they call an accelerator um, or a, just generally an effort that COVAX 6N. Uh, and so there are a range of innovations that are being developed as a result of these collaborations across these uh, multilateral agencies. Uh, and so that doesn't just involve vaccines, but also involves therapeutics 
and also involves um, uh, diagnostics uh, in particular, as well as sort of a health systems, um, uh, they call it a pillar, but it's sort of something that connects um, the various pillars to one another. And that's, I think that's important to keep in mind as well, because until um, we have more widespread vaccination rates, we still have to keep up with this virus, particularly as it's changing and ensure that these therapeutics are also getting uh, to people on the ground, let alone supplies like PPE. Um, that's still, these are still very much needs and issues that, that people are facing. So I didn't wanna sort of um, finish my comments without adding that. What I'll say in conclusion is, um, you know, how do, we, how do we ramp up? How do we get there sooner, right? We're not gonna be able to build factories, um, you know, tomorrow. Um, but this is why you did see and hear a, a call to action of governments themselves um, from the UN Secretary General or the head of WHO or from, you know, people like us as advocates really saying, okay, we need you US uh, and other countries to step up in a way that you can. And so it has been encouraging to see coming out of the G7 meeting um, this month, those commitments, including that from the US that Jeremy mentioned, but also from, from the EU and Germany. Um, and yet, it doesn't just take money. I think there is still very much a funding gap for the, the COVAX facility, but they also require doses, right? And it's been heartening to have other countries like France and Norway come through and commit their doses. And I think we're all hopeful that other countries will be able to follow suit so that COVAX can start to vaccinate sooner. Because as Jeremy said, we can't have this rolling out in other parts of the world um, into 2022 and 24 and beyond, that's, that's not a winnable fight. Um, and so it's a both and in that scenario. And, uh, and again, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from others um, how we get there, but, but more importantly, looking forward to, to how our countries around the world uh, really step up and, um, and really help us get across the finish line. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. John? Thanks. Um, thanks, Miriam. Thanks for inviting me. I'm pleased and honored to be here, uh, particularly with such a distinguished panel of experts. I, I want to briefly address four points. First, as has been recognized in today's world, infectious disease anywhere is infectious disease everywhere. COVID is clearly a case in point, and global problems need global solutions that embrace equity and access, as COVAX attempts to do. This pandemic has disproportionately affected vulnerable populations of people living in poverty, people of color, crowded slums, and the elderly. I'm particularly pleased that COVAX builds on the lessons learned from the revolving fund managed by the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO, um, for more than four decades since its inception in 1979. The PAHO Revolving Fund is a procurement mechanism that uses the power of bulk, pooled bulk purchasing to take advantage of economies of scale in order to negotiate more affordable prices for all its member countries. Prices negotiated are win-win for all. For countries, it means protecting its population against vaccine-preventable diseases, saving lives, and for the companies, it means dealing with one procurement entity rather than all 38 member states, and they get a great return on its investment. COVAX's mission is to secure this year 2 billion doses in order to vaccinate 20% of the global population. Although this goal is intermediate, historically it would be unprecedented. It would be fantastic if it is achieved so soon uh, with that in mind. But it's one thing to purchase a vaccine, it's another to get it into the arms of the folks who need it most. Other challenges to prevent the vaccine from sitting on the shelf where it does absolutely no good will be allocation, deployment, and creating community demand and ownership. So that brings me to my second point. There are daunting challenges to equitable global allocation and distribution, the least of which is the fact that the affluent countries are siphoning a substantial proportion of available doses to their own countries. They constitute only 16% of the world's population, but they have tied up probably more than 75% of the supply. They largely do this through pre-production contracts. Doses before they may, are made are sequestered by these contracts, 
preventing distribution to low and middle income countries, ultimately preventing them from being able to stop transmission of emerging variants in their tracks at the source. Additionally, manufacturers residing in more affluent countries often face regulations in their home countries that make it difficult, this vaccine nationalism, uh, to export vaccines until they service the needs of their own countries first. And COVAX negotiates commitment to free up these historical bottlenecks. As with yellow fever, cholera, and other vaccines for killer diseases, there may be a future role for a global stockpile. Such a stockpile provides doses to meet emergency upsurges and outbreaks when they occur. When supply is less limited, this is something to keep in mind for the future. Thirdly, with regards to the currently available COVID-19 vaccines, the pipeline continues to evolve very, very rapidly. There are more than 200 candidates being evaluated in animal and human trials. Of these, 20 are in the final stages of the human trials, the so-called random clinically, uh, clinical trial phase three or RCT3. Eight have completed the RCT3 three stage and think of what that means to a year ago. Such an amazing advancement in science that usually takes years if not decades to occur has happened as a result of working collectively together to make prevention possible, adding another tool as Lois referred to in our toolkit of masking, social distancing, hygiene, testing, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine when appropriate. CEPI, WHO, Gavi, UNICEF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the support of many countries, including the United States, in funding this research, these research efforts should be commended. Some five or six COVID-19 vaccines meet the WHO emergency use requirements that help ensure safety and efficacy for countries that use them. The producers of these vaccines each claim they can produce at least 1 billion doses per year, some even 2 to 3 billion doses. That, that amount makes achieving the global coverage of 20% by the end of this year very, very possible. Of the approved candidates, two producers use the RNA molecular technique, Pfizer and Moderna. Monitoring safety will be paramount because these vaccines are breaking new ground. Two vaccines are non-replicating viral vector vaccines that take advantage of the spike protein focus also to confirm uh, to confer the immune response. AstraZeneca and Sputnik vaccines are example examples. AstraZeneca does not do well as as well against the emerging variants, especially the South African, but even partial protection and 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 preventing hospitalization and deaths as it does it will will be life-saving. The, the cold chain requirement is much easier to manage with this product. And we know less about the Sputnik product from Russia, but it also appears safe and effective based on recently published RCT3 data. The Chinese Beijing inactivated vaccine also meets the WHO criteria. So we now also look to have three additional candidates close to approval the protein subunit vaccine of Novavax, the protein candidate vaccine from Sanofi Pasteur GSK partnership, and the non-replicating viral vector vaccine from Johnson & Johnson. This week, the US uh, FDA will authorize the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for use in the US. This vaccine is safe and effective and has added value of a much less stringent cold chain requirement. The DNA technology that it uses is much more heat stable than the other vaccines using RNA technologies. And it only requires one dose, which will make it operationally much easier to administer. I'd like to end by acknowledging that for vaccine deployment in developing countries of the world, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Most countries of the world have been successful in eliminating measles and rubella, eradicating polio, many of them successful in introducing new vaccines. Um, I've spent my career working on such initiatives. We have, we have to take advantage of this infrastructure, build on it, strengthen it, and not replace it. 
strategies are best implemented when they are integrated with other public health measures. We urgently need to learn whether COVID-19 vaccine candidates can be administered simultaneously with other life-saving vaccines. This should be a top priority. And finally, for all this to work, local community engagement is always absolutely critical in creating demand and trust in the vaccines being offered. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. Okay, and now Adam. Uh, thank you, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna be talking uh, from the perspective of uh, a systems engineer and primarily the distribution logistics supply chain issues. Um, so to start off, I would say that this, this, this problem that we're facing falls into the category of what I and others like to call simple but not easy. Um, you know, if you ask a, a firefighter what his job is, he might simplify it and say, I, I put the wet stuff on the red stuff, right? And it's, it's a relatively simple thing. We got to get a vaccine to people. Um, but by no means is it easy. Uh, and it's not easy because of the scale. Um, and not only the scale that is absolutely massive, but the uh, costs associated with it. Uh, so when we think about this problem, I think it's helpful to think of it in um, two main parts. You know, we, we break a supply chain into parts and the two main parts, the first part is the transport of the vaccine from the manufacturer to the country. Um, and I would argue that that is essentially not a, a large problem. That's been going very well. Uh, it's handled by a combination of the manufacturer uh, and the large shipping companies, uh, FedEx, UH, uh, UPS, DHL. And it's going well. Um, they've had plenty of lead time. They could invest. They've beefed up their facilities. Um, and it's working fine. Uh, one small issue um, that might be apparent is a, a lot of the times, especially going to um, places that are off the major routes, they use what's called belly cargo. Um, and that's basically just putting cargo in a commercial plane. With the, with the commercial airline system impacted, that might not be an option uh, these days. But again, I don't think that's a major problem. Uh, so for the second part of the supply chain, and that's basically from when, when the vaccine is in country, getting it distributed, uh, that's where I think the biggest challenges are. Um, and, you know, I've, I've kind of broken down into really six things that you need. Um, you need detailed planning uh, and roughly six month lead time. Um, you need a lot of people to carry it out. Uh, you need very comprehensive communications um, internally, uh, but also to the public. Uh, you need facilities, you need equipment, uh, syringes, PPE, disposal systems. And then lastly, which I think is, is probably the biggest issue, is you need investments. Um, and for this, we need investments in uh, cold chain storage. And uh, we need to have investments in an IT backbone for uh, basic tracking of uh, supply and if we're doing two shots, then you have to track that. Uh, not Nothing too complicated, but you do need some sort of IT backbone. So again, from a systems engineering perspective, normally in these situations, uh, the problems or the bottlenecks occur at the final step or what we call, you know, um, the last mile um, or at the points of distribution, as we call them. Uh, but in this situation right now, what we're seeing that there's a very constrained supply, it's just kind of trickling down. So you're not gonna see those problems. But what's happening obviously is that we're ramping up in terms of the amount of vaccines that are available and also um, the uh, manufacturing capacity. So as we ramp up, um, that those supply issues are probably gonna shift and going from a supply constrained environment you're going to one where there's plenty of supply and your bottleneck is going to be again where it typically is at the distribution system the last mile so that that is going to be interesting so these systems in my opinion have to kind of be nimble and be able to adjust um, uh, which just points to kind of a well thought out and well designed system that's scalable and has some flexibility um, the world health organization gabby they provide a really good technical guidance, there's really good documents and it helps countries plan. Uh, but again, that planning needs to occur. 
And uh, as Mike Tyson famously said, you know, a plan is, uh, um, is only as good until you get hit in the face. So uh, not only you need a plan, but you need, you need that capacity um, there to be able to execute it. Right? Um, so to me, again, the biggest issue right now is the ability to maintain that cold and that ultra cold chain storage. Um, so you basically need freezers. Um, these require a lot of energy. They're not cheap per se. And they're not, um, they're not typically uh, in many developing countries, except for maybe in a research lab. Uh, so you need a lot of those. Um, so yeah, you might be asking yourself, you know, we, we you know, uh, John talked about different uh, viruses, uh, different um, vaccines, some that don't need cold chain storage, some that need one shot. And you might ask yourself, well, why don't we just have a strategy where we rely on one of those? Um, and, you know, it's interesting to think, and, and but I think that's a high risk strategy if you kind of plan everything based on having this one virus that you want to have i mean you just might not have it um and you know generally in supply chains you need to have uh kind of flexibility you need to have slack so if you if you design your supply chain really narrowly and something happens you know that it's not um it's not good for that variant or there's a manufacturing problem you know it, it might cause some really big problems um, so not only the physical things, but you also need, you know, there's one interesting initiative um, uh, that that addresses kind of the non-physical items, but insurance. So there's an initiative with the startup called Parcel and the Lloyd's reinsurance and insurance market uh, that not only provides uh, mechanisms for insurance, but also provides data to uh, essentially reduce risk in the supply chain. Um, and then if you want to just generalize, you know, what we know in general disaster management and also what we've seen so far, the, the three things that I've picked up, are, which has been said already, you know, all disasters are local. Uh, so generally, the strategy should be to beef up local supply chains and beef up uh, existing health infrastructure versus recreating it. Uh, that's always, always a strategy in some some options, some places you're not going to have the option uh, and the outside party is going to have come in and do it. But generally, yeah, absolutely. Use what's available and beef it up versus trying to recreate it. Um, second, if we could use this opportunity uh, to plan for the next one. Uh, so so also think, okay, maybe maybe the equipment we'll invest in now could be used for other campaigns. So always use the current disaster to mitigate for future ones. Uh, and then the last point is that, you know, communicate, communicate, and be very transparent. Um, you know, you have to have the cooperation you have to be uh, if the public is against you uh, you're, you're screwed so you have to be with them and you have to, the way to do that is you know open and transparent communication so lastly uh, what I want to say is I you know I'm just kind of thinking as preparing for this like what could be done um, you know what can we do in the US to help support countries and if you think about it as our as we are going to be going on the downslope they're going to be going on the upslope and one thing we're going to have an oversupply is, is freezers uh, so that kind of led me to an idea of well, what if we could collect uh, what if we could collect all these excess uh, cold chain store uh, medical cold chain storage freezers and uh, you know uh, divert them and not, even further what if we develop these modular um, in like maybe smaller shipping containers um, that they could store the vaccine and then they could be put on a truck and, and be taken from the capital city to the more rural areas. Uh, so it's just an idea I have, but um, I'm proud to say that the GW Innovation Lab is also interested in that idea. So we're, we're going to try and take that idea and turn it into more, more of a, a concept um, starting next week. Uh, so we're excited about that. Um, and then the absolute last thing I'll say is that if you want more information, um, a couple things I'll give you is there's a really good podcast called The COVAX Files by Sarani Fernando. Uh, Dr. Prashant Yadav at the Global Center for Global Development uh, is a really good source. And then the New York Times has a really cool uh, visual, uh, visual vaccine tracker that kind of gives the status of everything. So um, thank you and uh, appreciate uh, everybody else's comments. Thank you so much, uh, Adam, and uh, to all of our panelists. So this is uh, excellent. I'm rarely ever a moderator on a panel where people actually respect time limits. So this is great. Thank you so much. Uh, so we had uh, circulated some questions ahead of time. And, uh, and I wanted to go ahead and start with this first one. And, uh, you know, something that I heard uh, 
across all the panel, not all the panelists, but one of the things that I struggle with, right, is this idea of, um, you know, how do we solve this global problem? And as Jeremy very nicely laid out, you know, this, this is a global problem, obviously, for because uh, of this weakest link idea, but also because we do need to cooperate to produce the vaccine and, and to beef up uh, supply chains and try to mitigate some of the competition uh, for vaccines and, and, um, and hoarding processes. But, um, but both, both Lois and John mentioned regional mechanisms. And I'm increasingly wondering what the role of regional mechanisms are in terms of global health, right? So Lois mentioned the African Union, which has done amazing work um, via the Africa CDC that was established after uh, the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And, uh, and done many of the same things uh, as John has described in terms of pooling resources, um, forming public-private partnerships for um, boosting testing capacity and um, developing rapid testing and uh, procure, procuring PPE, right? So I'm wondering if, if maybe the solution isn't at the global level, that perhaps we need to be thinking a little bit more at, at a regional level. Um, and that's just, you know, my question uh, to you. But also, you know, another frustration I have is that we're always, we're addressing the crisis at hand and we're not thinking in a prospective way and we're not thinking in a preventative way. And so what we're seeing right now in terms of humanitarian health is that you're seeing funding for humanitarian crises or existing health development programs being diverted to COVID, right? So that you're seeing development rollback in other areas. We're seeing um, the absence of, uh, you know, vaccination for other areas. So you're seeing increases in cases of malaria. You're seeing um, the lack of uh, maternal and uh, uh, infant care, and so you're seeing an increase in maternal deaths. And you're because there's a diversion of funding. There's a diversion of resources. So I'm wondering how we build um, a more sustainable model. And this is the first question to you, um, which I had pre-circulated. Um, so how can we use COVAX to build a better system for the next global health crisis? And I guess my caveats are, is, is the solution really global? And how do we make the system more sustainable? And um, I think maybe what we'll do is just go in the same order that we had um, uh, presented. So Jeremy, if you'd like to answer that first, and then we'll go to Lois. Sure, thank you. Yeah, this is the the eternal issue that I think we face when we're talking about global health governance. We're always responding to the previous issue, and we're not always thinking prospectively. Um, you know, there there are a few things that, that come to mind. One is that you know, if we look at the actual budget for the World Health Organization, we put more and more responsibilities on the WHO to do all of these things. It has a budget um, on an annual basis, which is roughly equivalent to what Americans spend on alkaline batteries. So we are putting more and more responsibilities on this organization um, and not, not, not giving it the, the sort of funding that it needs. Plus, its funding is very segmented, so the WHO itself has very little control over its actual agenda. Um, and so what I think is, instead of trying to predict what the next pandemic is going to be, what I think we need to do is to remember that the member states of the WHO are the ones who have the power to empower that organization to do more things, to, to give it the, the agency, the flexibility, the ability to, to respond to these sorts of, of crises. You know, there was the, the horrible irony that because of these, these funding shortfalls that the World Health Organization faced right before the Ebola outbreak, they had to cut their budget for pandemic preparedness and planning by 50%. And we, you know, we, we see, see, see some of the elements there. When public health is really successful, we don't really see it. So it can be hard to generate that, that sort of continued momentum for it. But I, I would be hopeful that, that there would be some, some momentum after this. And I think this is where, um, where it's going to be really important. We need someone to, t to step up and take leadership. We need some country or some group of countries willing to take that mantle, to work with civil society, to work with other countries and say, yes, we recognize that we have had these, these failings, these shortcomings, and we're going to work on, on doing something to make the WHO or other sorts of structures uh, better and better able to, to respond to this. 
otherwise we're going to get all of these responses, all of these postmortems. how can we fix things? And they're just going to sit on the shelf and collect us, unless there's someone who's willing to step up and put some, some actual political muscle behind some uh, of these efforts. So that's where one thing that I would really focus on is making sure that we, that we, that we have some political leadership to, to take this on and to try to do something um, so that we can be better able to respond to the next pandemic, whatever that might be. Okay, and I'm just going to probe you. So who who should take the mantle? Oh, goodness. Um, Realistically, you know, who has the, you know, political credibility right now to do that? Well, I mean, this could be a real opportunity for the Biden administration to show that the United States is actually reengaging in global health and is, that this is a serious sort of commitment. Um, but, you know, a lot of times we look to, to the, those sorts of middle powers, those sorts of, you know, good international citizens to, to lead these sorts of, of charges. And I think there could be some some opportunities there. We, you know, we've also seen some of these um, vaccine diplomacy efforts that the Chinese government, the Indian government, the Russian government in particular have been been taking the lead on. And if we can perhaps reorient those a little bit so that they're not focused so much on developing the soft power, building those sorts of bilateral relationships and the, the geopolitical um, difficulties there, and to, to reframe them almost more in the sense that we saw back in the, the mid 20th century with the smallpox eradication campaign, that could be an effort where we get some of the leading states to come together and say, yep, this is something that, that, that we're, we're willing to do, and that there is this unified effort. That's not something that is just being done by, say, the U.S. to try to, to look better in the aftermath of, of the Trump administration and its um, disinterest in, in global health matters. Okay, thank you. Lois? Yeah, no, um, I, 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 well, the follow on to what Jeremy was saying, um, it's been heartening for us. I mean, GHG was one of the groups really rallying for WHO in the past year and even before. Uh, and so uh, we're really upset by the U.S. not engaging or not continuing to engage or fund the organization and really pleased to see this administration um, follow through on its promises. Um, and if we look at some of what they've, they've published, there is an intent to work alongside WHO in a very different way towards those uh, efforts to sort of evolve or modernize. It's not even modernizing it, but just sort of kind of getting out of their way, um, I think, uh, in many regards. Um, and so it's, it's, it's great to see some of the proposals that have been put out by other countries and, you know, see whether or not the U.S. will, will, will follow suit. But back to, to your, your original question, you know, I think it's great and good to strengthen WHO and also critically important that we, I think, have an opportunity, frankly, as, as the U.S. also to show our support for regional efforts and programs and to really be a part of this call to shift the power. Um, and if nothing else, kind of smartly decentralized to some degree, not in a way that hinders our, you know, collective efforts, but in a way that doesn't hamstring us in a way, you know, Adam talked about, right? Like, it's just, it's just a smart way to do business, to diversify your investments uh, and, and your bets. Um, and so I'm, I'm hopeful um, that COVAX um, and just this experience around COVID and how people are rallying will sort of teach us uh, that lesson. I also want to come back to the point you made around health systems themselves. I mean, we really are not going to get out of this crisis, nor are we going to really with, be able to withstand the next one unless we get serious about systems themselves, uh, supply chains, workforce, you know, financing, data and surveillance. I mean, they're basics of health care uh, and public health, frankly, and yet uh, the investments there are paltry, even worse than, you know, across global health and development broadly. And so we at GHG have been trying to make that case. Um, to policymakers that, okay, this is what we meant when we were talking about <laughs> investing in people, right? Um, and being prepared for the next thing that we don't know is coming. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah, and that's so important because uh, you, when we look right now, uh, you have two new Ebola outbreaks on the African continent, right? Um, in Guinea and in uh, DRC. And uh, so, you know, I think the reality is, and this is not new to anybody that pays attention to global health, but we're going to continue to see these layers upon layers of crisis. And if we don't kind of do some of the hard work and deep thinking of how do we set up 
sustainable and preventative systems, we're just going to be kind of chasing our tails constantly, right? I mean, I know it's easier and, than done, but this is my my big... Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, Marian, because you reminded me of a, a point that I did want to make here. I think people know, right? But we have seen Africa do well in this crisis, and it's credit to CDC. It's also credit to its citizens who have stepped up and other leaders in, uh, in the region. And so I think that too is an, an argument for how we think differently about this response and other responses, because if we rely on, I mean, frankly, the countries we typically rely on for this stuff did not do as well. So I just want to say that out loud, right? And I'm glad that they're, we're trying to turn a corner here and in other parts of the world and that these same countries are stepping up with their contributions. Um, but let's really look closely at who's leading in this moment and allow them to lead the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. John? Yes, thank you. Uh, they've been great comments. I want to focus on the leadership and the difficulty in sustaining all this is actually an opportunity to fill that gap in leadership. And that's what I would encourage this current Biden administration to really consider uh, putting us back in a leadership role, promoting the CDC as our stellar uh, public health agency that is recognized globally. You know, being a, a, an active, uh, engaged leader with this, I really appreciate the comment made by Jeremy about the funding to WHO. I'm, I was a former deputy director of the Pan American Health Organization, and it was such a struggle. But I've had a couple of deja vu moments during this conversation, and I kept thinking about the crisis that happened in 2010 in Haiti. First, an earthquake nine months later, devastated by cholera. And when WHO can get it right, it's, it's, um, it's amazing. Did it do well? Did it do perfect? No. But it did make an amazing uh, contribution uh, to the effort by coordinating, by being supported by the U.S., Canadian, and uh, other governments uh, to take a technical lead and to operationalize many of the strategies, the, 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 the arrival eventually of vaccines. So, I think that's that'll be an important part going uh, forward. This accountability part of it is just um, very, very difficult to address. But in 2005, folks at that time said the old IHR focusing on four diseases, plague, yellow fever, smallpox, and um, cholera was not the tool that, that it was intended. So they modified, and so we came out with the IHR 2005 version, which then looked at any public health emergency. And I agree about what was said uh, by Adam about these crises are local. So you, you have to build the capacity at the local level, but make governments uh, accountable. And you do that by working together. The neighboring country, if empowered and supported by WHO and other partners, there the chances of making that country accountable uh, is so much greater. Haiti is the poorest country in our hemisphere. I've worked all over the world. It's one of the most difficult countries to work in. There are more NGOs per capita in Haiti than anywhere, but they're not coordinated well. And I think uh, there are opportunities. I'll stop there, but I, I appreciate the other comments. Uh, they were excellent. Thank you. Adam? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess to kind of uh, not repeat, um, in my opinion, I'll, I'll say, and it's not only in the developing world, I mean, it's in the U.S. Um, equally, uh, you know, in, in terms of, of getting money uh, to where it needs to go, uh, I think there's always in the, the federal and the state governments um, kind of think a lot of themselves and they think they provide a lot more value than they do. So uh, for me, um, getting, you know, if we're talking about financing um, or equipment, you know, trying to get that down to as local level as possible. I think that's, you know, a, a really uh, good strategy that really kind of optimizes uh, what whatever you have to give um, or to provide. Uh, so yeah, trying to trying to kind of I would you know bypass might be a strong word, but um, uh, but just trying to get it as local as possible. I think that's my key point. 
Perfect. Yeah. And so this comment about the United States is something I struggled with because the uh, the topic for this specific roundtable is global equity. But, you know, there's a lot of inequity within the United States right now in, in terms of who is getting who is who has been affected, um, you know, marginalized populations that have been affected, people of color um, in particular by the disease. Uh, and are among the least vaccinated, right? And so we we have our own issues here with equity, but um, I digress. So we do have a question from the audience, so I'll go ahead and ask that. And then uh, I, I think whoever wants to go ahead and answer it, I'm not sure that everyone can. So the question is, how can we or should we engage with multilateral and development finance institutions and the private sector to better ensure equitable storage and access? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, yes, uh, there, there, are, there are a number of models out there, but I think one bottom line that would be a guiding principle, a value that we should all um, in, embrace is that po poverty is one of the key drivers that make these events occur. And uh, to embrace poverty as a pool, it's, it, you know, there are the poorest countries, but poverty actually, there more, there's more people living in poverty among, among middle income countries. So my plea is that it be a broader view of what poverty is and the support required to very fragile middle income countries, as well as the poorest of the poor. That would be my point. Yeah, and I, I appreciate this question um, because I don't know if a lot of people are paying attention to the World Bank. Um, the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. These are places that have made commitments, um, financial ones, um, to addressing the COVID issue. And so these resources are sitting there. I think we, as health advocates or practitioners, um, could do more to direct that funding um, so that they're, you know, it's 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 moving in the right way and having the the desired impact. Um, and because it's it's very much an all hands in, all hands on deck situation. Thus the question, right? Like, how do we get outside of just the the talk of WHO and UNICEF and others. And the reality is that's happening. Um, I don't know if enough people are connecting those dots um, to again ensure that those resources are used um, as effectively as they could be. It's, it, you know, it, there's, it's a work in progress, I would say. Um, but um, I think it's a good sign of things to come and things that were already brewing. I mean, the bank had already made a commitment to health system strengthening in a way that frankly, other health, even other health institutions hadn't done. And so I think there is a level of political will and readiness there um, that preceded COVID and maybe that we could build on moving forward. And just to, to build on what, what Lois was saying, you know, I'm ultimately a pragmatist. So if we've got access, if there, if there are multilateral financial institutions or development organizations or, or civil society groups that we can, we can call on, yes, let's do this. This is, this is, this is the emergency. This is the time to do it. Um, but I think it's also then, I think this is going back to your previous question, Marin, this is really where I think the regional organizations can play such an important role because we do want to have some measure of coordinating or just someone kind of overseeing what's going on because we do you know the more organizations that we bring in the more possibility that arises that we're inadvertently replicating things one part of the, the world and not paying enough attention to what's happening in another part or that that we are missing out on on particular elements and so to have some sort of of coordinating body there can be really useful and that's probably something that that a group like PAHO is going to be a better place to do than the WHO just having those sorts of pre-existing uh, connections. Again, we don't have to, to recreate the, the wheel, especially in the midst of a pandemic. We have some of these structures that are in place, so let's take advantage of them. Let's use them. If there are these other parties that that have the, these resources, as Lois was saying, yeah, let's let's make sure that we are calling attention to that and that, that we're doing it in a way that, that actually is going to, to benefit people in the long run, and then build upon that going forward so that we can do the health system strengthening. We can make sure that we have the resilient systems that, can, that will be in place to respond to whatever happens to to pop up next. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Adam. Do you want to take a stab at this one, or? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll just add. I'll add my thoughts and uh, slightly different what other people say. But I think one 
is in terms of, I think there's a huge, and generally there always is, we underestimate how much this is going to cost. Um, I think we're very focused on the cost of the actual vaccine, but I would estimate that the cost of um, storage distribution, um, and I would think this is probably going to dwarf that. Um, and then, I, yeah, I think in terms of what's one of the most valuable things you can give is, is cash, essentially. Um, you know, there's, there's good ways to do it and not good ways to do it. But uh, probably, in my opinion, one of the most valuable things you can do to, uh, to provide capacity is, is providing cash. Um, so ha, ha, I'm no expert on how you do that, but all I know is that that, that is, is a valuable thing to, to provide. Right. Okay. So we're kind of coming up on the end of time, our time together. Um, it's sad because I, I think we could go on for hours. So I'm just going to end with this really hard question and we'll check in with you in a year. and We'll, we'll uh, see if you were right here. Um, but the last question that we had pre-circulated pre -circulate, pre was where will we be this time next year? Um, so this is your moment to, to make a big prediction for next year. If you could all kind of just answer that question in 30 seconds or or less. <laughs> we can start with Lois. <laughs> and I thought you would come to me first. Uh, I think I think we'll still be doing this COVID thing, unfortunately. And I just I think we should be prepared for that. It won't be in the same way, hopefully. Um, but um, you know, if this past year has taught us anything, it's that this might be stick around for a while. Um, particularly if we don't get it right in in the majority of the world, which is what we're trying talking talking about here today. So we'll see if I'm wrong. I would like to be. Okay, thanks. Uh, Adam? Sure, I, I think uh, this time next year, uh, there's gonna be a lot more optimism, um, but I hope things don't return back to normal. I really don't. I hope, I hope we uh, make a lot of big changes from this and we realize you know, what the trends are in, in our society, in, in the world, and uh, we don't go back to normal. We, we go, uh, we adapt. John? Well said. Um, I would add that, you know, the introduction of the vaccine in Ghana, it, another deja vu moment where Nicaragua introduced rotavirus vaccine the same year the United States did. And within a matter of a very short period of time, you saw the hockey stick, of the number of countries going up. So I think it would be nice to reflect on a graphic that would show this tremendous uptake of these products that have become available, that we've confronted vaccine hesitancy, we've built local systems and that will that will be sustained. And as as mentioned, we get it right. Thank you very much for organizing this. Thank you, John. And Jeremy, last word. I I think I'm I'm probably there with, with Lloyd and Adam and, and John and everyone else. We'll probably we're, we're still going to be in in the same place in terms of COVID still going to be a thing that we're dealing with. My hope is that we're starting to build those systems, though, to really think about what happens next, that we're not waiting until we finish, until COVID goes away before we think, okay, we can start to think about the, building these more sustainable systems. This is the time to take advantage of the attention, of the energy, and the, the publicity, for lack of a better term, on global health, and I hope that we're starting to take advantage of that by this time next year. Great, right. So I share that. Uh optimism, pessimism. Um, I do think we'll be doing this for quite some time. And, uh, but I do see a lot of opportunity. The NHS uh, in the UK was born out of World War II, right? And uh, many of the comprehensive uh, state healthcare systems in Europe were built out of uh, World War II and a solidarity movement that kind of uh, followed. So I do think that, you know, we could use this moment to build some global solidarity around health and more sustainable systems. And hopefully, you know, uh, we can kind of push that in our own ways uh, and, and make that happen. But I do think that's what, you know, we need um, to to confront, I, I think, what will be more frequent and uh, types of, you know, natural disasters that involve um, humanitarian health as well. Uh, thank you so much for uh, attending. Uh, to those of you who shared your lunch hour with us, thank you for our panelists and to the co-sponsors of this event. I very much enjoyed it and I hope you did too. Have a wonderful weekend.